Hello my friends, in this video I'll be showing you the autosomal DNA results, predicted phenotype traits and GD match results of a uh, western hunter gatherer woman from Germany who lived in the Mesolithic. Let me show you the location. This is where she lived. Um, she lived in the Mesolithic period. In, um, let's see the time, the time period is 71 to 62 centuries before the common era. A long time ago uh, at this point in time in in this region of germany people were hunting and gathering and she is a western hunter gatherer uh, in europe there were basically two distinct branches of hunter gatherers there were the western hunter gatherers in the west of europe and there were the eastern hunter gatherers in the east and she is a western hunter gatherer uh, those two branches are actually quite distinct in terms of their genetics the eastern hunter gatherers had affinities to uh, Native Americans and and South Asians, whereas the Western hunter gatherers did not really have any affinities to any populations outside of Europe. So this individual is a Western hunter gatherer, and her mitochondrial lineage is U4B1. And in terms of the Y, uh, Y DNA, she does not have Y DNA. She's a female. Does not have a Y chromosome. Does not have Y DNA. Uh, in terms of the um, GD match. Unfortunately, I cannot actually show you her GD match results. It's very funny. Uh, I got this uh, error when I tried to log in. Apparently, I've been banned, and it's an IP ban because none of my accounts that I have made for GD match work. So I was IP banned from GD match. I don't even know. I did, I did not know this was possible to do, but I have achieved getting IP banned from GD match. Absolutely crazy. Uh, don't worry about it though. It's uh, this is something I can easily circumnavigate because I have Admixture Studio and the only thing I use GED Match for is basically the ethnicity estimates and I don't really need to use it in in this in this way because I have Admixture Studio. So let me show you what she scores with Eurogene's K36. It's a typical Western Hunter Gatherer. It scores the same as what a typical Western Hunter Gatherer scores. There's nothing really to talk about much, but I want to show you her results with Eurogene's K36 because I think it might be interesting for you guys to see what modern populations she resembles the most. And with the modern populations, she's actually getting modeled as a mixture of Phenoscandian 37%. That's the largest component. The largest component she's scoring is Phenoscandian or Finnish, uh, followed by that. And keep in mind, she's from Germany, so definitely not from Finland. But followed by that is East Central European, which is really... Uh, a Lithuanian component. This is a component that peaks in Latvians and Lithuanians and Baltic people in general. So Finnish plus Baltic make up the overwhelming majority of her uh, modern groups, so to speak. Followed by that is North Sea, which is a component that peaks in Irish people and Scandinavians. So Irish, Scandinavian, uh, Northwest European. And finally, this is something that might be surprising to you guys, is that she's actually scoring 7.3% Basque. And Basque are kind of a Mediterranean group, right? But they actually have a very significant portion of ancestry from Western hunter-gatherers. So what you might be expecting, if you know a little bit about genetics and you know that Finnish people are the most... Um, the most northern... Finnish people and Balts are the most northern of, of Europeans and they have uh, the most hunter-gatherer genes you might be expecting that this circle would be filled up with Phenoscandian and East Central Europe. And I guess it kind of is. The majority of the circle is Phenoscandian and East Central, East Central European. But the point is there is even a little bit of Basque that this person is scoring. So she had a little bit of affinities to modern Basque people, which is very interesting. Um, Basque people actually derive a major portion of their ancestry from the Western hunter-gatherers. There is 3.8% North Atlantic and there is 0.9% Eastern European. And she's not scoring any non-European components. She's uh, very uniquely Northern European in her ancestry. Go ahead and look at her phenotype. Let me show you what she scores with Nashakot. I actually added a really new uh, new feature here, which is kind of like a phenotype oracle. So you see there's phenotypes she's closest to. Uh, this is the closest to her. This is the second closest to her. This is the third closest to her. This phenotypes she might be closest to, but there's actually, uh, there's actually now an oracle for phenotypes, what mixture of two phenotypes she resembles the most, which is, I think, really cool. Uh, I had a lot of fun implementing this um, this feature. So, this is the closest mixture to her, followed by this, followed by this, followed by this, and followed, lastly, by this. 
So this kind of a mixture you could probably find in Europe, modern, central or southern Europeans who have uh, one parent who looks like this and one parent who looks like this for all of these for all of these uh, mixtures. It is not particularly Northern European because among the Northern Europeans, there are no people who are this dark in color, um, as dark in color as the folks on the top. Uh, so I would say this, this kind of a mixture is something you will find in Central or Southern Europe, but not necessarily in, say, Britain or Finland. When it comes to her coloring, let's look at the actual numbers. It looks like she's got hazel eyes, 63.6% .6 likelihood of hazel eyes, most likely hazel eye color. Uh, we can say she definitely does not have darkest brown eyes because the likelihood of that is only 0.005%, so definitely doesn't have darkest brown eyes. Uh, regular brown eyes are sort of possible for her. Uh, blue eyes are sort of possible for her at 3.9% likelihood, although not very likely. Uh, blue eyes with an amber center ring are also quite possible. And green eyes are also quite possible, but most likely... Uh, most likely her eye color is hazel. That's 63.6% .6 likelihood of that. For hair color, it looks like she's got black hair. Although dark brown, light brown, and dark blonde hair is actually also possible. R uh, light blonde or red hair is not really... There is not much probability for that. But most likely her hair, hair color is dark or black, some kind of a dark shade of hair. For skin color, it looks like she's got all or Mediterranean skin. And if you if you scroll back to the phenotypes, all of these phenotypes that she's closest to have sort of an all or Mediterranean skin, maybe aside from the first one. The first one is maybe lighter a little bit, but these two folks certainly have all or Mediterranean skin. And in the uh, two-way oracle, you can see all of the folks on top have all or Mediterranean skin tone, except for maybe this guy. Uh, this, guy this guy and this, and this woman are... I'd say more of a light brown skin tone than olive. Uh, and for hair texture, it looks like she's got wavy, wavy hair, although curly and straight hair is also quite possible. Um, actually, really possible. So most likely she's got wavy hair, but once again, straight and curly is not out of the picture. But she definitely does not have kinky hair because the likelihood of kinky hair is below 0.1%. Uh, definitely doesn't have any sort of kinky hair. When it comes to coloring related variants and kinky, is, I showed the picture here on the, on the top, uh, what it might look like. It's kind of like an African or, uh, yeah, Afro shaped hair. So for coloring related variants found in the file, we see that she's got BEH3, uh, very typical for Western hunter gatherers. She's got BEH2, she's got BEH1. And in fact, she has two light color variants for all of the variations, or all of the relevant variations in the HERC2 and NOCO2 region which is also something that um, is quite typical for Western hunter-gatherers and European hunter-gatherers in general. Uh, it's just extreme depigmentation in one specific region, in the region of HERC2 and OCO2. Um, but it is this kind of depigmentation is actually not enough. Oh my. This kind of depigmentation is actually not even enough to give her blue eyes or blonde hair. And the reason it is not enough to give her blue eyes and blonde hair is because of genotypes like this. She doesn't have any light color variants in SLC 24A5. Uh, this is a variation that's really relevant to the color of eyes, hair, and skin. Uh, she does not have any light color variants in this variation of SLC 45A2. Once again, super important uh, variation for uh, eyes, hair, and skin. Only one light color variant here. Once again, this is super important for eyes, hair, skin. So because of genotypes like this, uh, because, of, because of these exotic genotypes, uh, she actually does not even have blue eyes or blonde hair, despite having this extremely light, uh, this extremely depigmented genotype in the HERC2 and OCA2 region, because uh, of the other exotic genotypes that she has, which my Nashakot and trait predictor take into account, unlike unlike the other tools. Yeah. So, um, what else is interesting? What else is interesting is she has two light colored variants in this variation of IRF4. Once again, this is a very European hunter gatherer. Uh, light color variants in this variation are very, very, very European hunter gatherer um, genotypes to have. Nowadays, light color variants here are not really found at a high frequency among Europeans. Uh, only they are only sort of found at a high frequency among the Irish and, uh, surprisingly enough, the Komis in Russia. But uh, among the European hunter gatherers, pretty much all of them maybe maybe not all of them but most of them had two light color variants here in this variation right here and this is implicated in the color of eyes hair and skin 
and but it's it's not particularly important. It's not one of those variations that's just kind of like end all be all to the pigmentation of eyes, hair, and skin. But it does play a role. I'll just put it this way. Uh, it's one of the variations that plays a sort of a moderately large role in the pigmentation of especially eye color, but also hair color and skin color. All right, now let's go ahead and look at her polygenic risk scores and what kind of traits she has. We're going to start with the polygenic risk scores, and it looks like she has got a average score for schizophrenia and average score for type 2 diabetes. She's got a high score for Alzheimer's, so we have to we have to explore Alzheimer's a little bit and see what contributed to that. She's got a below average score for multiple sclerosis. She's got free risk guidance for breast cancer out of 24, uh, which is pretty average. She's got 11 risk guidance for testicular cancer out of 24, which is pretty typical. And uh, she's got two risk guidance for celiac disease out of 12, which is pretty typical. Uh, zero for, uh, risk guidance for GSS out of 18. Why is it showing up this way? That's funny. Okay, so she's got zero risk guidance for GSS out of 18, which is, I guess, um, pretty typical. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's good. It's good. Zero risk guidance is good always. Uh, five risk guidance for Crohn's out of 28, which is kind of not, not that good. So we have to explore Crohn's, Crohn's disease and what she scores for that a little bit. So we can have we have to keep in mind that she's got a high score for Alzheimer's and uh, you know something that needs to be explored for Crohn's for Reifenstein's one risk variant of twenty six. Unfortunately, we can't really fact check that, but uh, one risk variant for Reifenstein's is probably not that bad. And for Parkinson's, she's got four out of five out of uh, forty six, which is pretty typical. I've seen that a lot with some of the samples I've I've run for my tool. Um, for some reason, there is like five or four that. Uh, and I haven't, I've never seen somebody score more than five, but uh, I have seen five out of something like 46 or 50 plenty of times. So we have to keep in mind Alzheimer's and we have to keep in mind Crohn's. All right. So for their mental health results section, it looks like she's got AA in comt met variation, meaning Warrior genotype in Compt and also Warrior genotype in MAOA. So she's definitely a Warrior, a uh, very stereotypically European genotype to have lower activity of both Compt and MAOA enzyme. Therefore, uh, slower breakdown of dopamine, therefore more dopamine building up in the system. More dopamine in the system means advantages in attention tasks and motivation, disadvantages in stress-related uh, stress conditions. Uh, very stereotypically European genotype in both COMT and MAOA. Uh, she's got heterozygous genotype in zrd 2 pro pro variation, which means intermediate number of dopamine D2 receptor sites in the brain. Uh, kind of typical for Europeans. Uh, most people outside of Europe would not have the no-go learner variants. No, uh, none of them. Not one, not two, none of them. Uh, having no goal learner variants in general is a very European, European trait. She doesn't have two no goal learner variants, so she's not homozygous for the no goal learner variants in DRD2 Pro 19 Pro, but she has one, and that's already quite European. That's already quite European. She does not have the A1 only one TAC1, so it looks like she's got a slightly higher number of dopamine, dopamine D2 receptor sites in the brain and a slightly lower risk of stuff like ADHD and alcoholism. Really good to see. It looks like she does not have long form 5 htclpr and she does not have a decrease in the risk of depression. And it looks like she also has this genotype in HTR2A. I just added this yesterday, uh, which, re which leads to a robustly increased risk of suicidal behavior and depression and increased risk of sexual dysfunction when taking SSRI and antidepressants. And she also has this genotype in H2, HTR2A, which leads to lower odds for, su for suicidal ideation. So. This is kind of a good, um, kind of a good genotype, but this is not so good. And she also has this genotype right here in this variation, uh, IDS twenty five five thirty one, which leads to long form five HTTLPR and lower risk of depression. The thing is, with these five HTTLPR, with these um, variations that determine long or short form five HTTLPR, if you have one genotype that determines long form, just one, that means you're gonna have long form. Uh, if you have like two, uh, if you have one genotype that, determine, that determines short form and one genotype that determines long form, you're gonna have long form. The only way to have short form is if you have two genotypes that determine short form. That's how it works. So in her case, she and what's what's even more crazy uh, is that in both of these variations that determine long or sh or short form 5 htlpr the allele that determines long form 5 htlpr is actually dominant over the allele that determines short form. So. Basically, you have these four alleles. It's it's extremely like super dominant. This trait is super dominant. If you have you have, you got four alleles, right? If one of them is long form five HTTLPR, that means you're gonna have long form five HTTLPR. That's how it works. So in her case, she has long form five HTTLPR. Really good for her. Lower risk of depression. 
but these uh, long form alleles are actually pretty rare. So uh, they're super dominant, but they are pretty rare. Put it this way. Uh, for mental health results, autism, we're going to skip that. For DDC, we're going to skip. Lactose persistence, it looks like she does not carry the European lactose persistence mutation. Very interesting for OXTR and the empathy gene. It looks like she's got heterozygous genotype in this variation of OXTR, which means one sociopath variant and one variant for increased OXTR expression. Uh, one empath, one sociopath variant. She's also heterozygous here. Very interesting. Okay, so I guess she's between sociopath and empath um, phenotypes. In terms of the diabetes, it looks like she does not have type 1 diabetes. Really good to see. For hemochromatosis, it looks like she does not have any risk variance for hemochromatosis yet. Good to see. No risk variance for that. Uh, we remember that among the earlier samples I've done, it was the Sungir Cromanions who had risk variance for hemochromatosis. So they were actually the earliest humans with uh, risk variance for this particular disease. For Alzheimer's, it looks like she does... Oh, oh, snap. So she has one risk allele for Alzheimer's in this APOE variation. So she, she actually has a risk allele for Alzheimer's in APOE, which is very significant. So that's why the score for Alzheimer's was so high. And all of everything else here sort of contributes to the score a little bit as well. But the biggest contribution was this risk allele for Alzheimer's and APOE. So she has a risk allele in APOE. This is big. For multiple sclerosis, looks like no risk variance for multiple sclerosis. All right. For cardiovascular disease panel. Um, when I say no risk variance for multiple sclerosis, I really mean no risk variance in HLA. Uh, because this is by far the most important gene implicated in this specific trait. Uh, like this, for example, I don't really care about that that much. Uh, it doesn't matter too much to me. Um, it does play a role, but it's not that important, to be honest. For cardiovascular disease panel, we're going to skip that. For myopia, it looks like she does not have the G allele here, which would protect from myopia. But she does have other genotypes which protect from myopia, uh, which is really cool. I actually ordered, uh, you might not know this, but I actually ordered for some of these panels, I ordered the um, uh, the genotypes by by their um respective weight right by their respective impact on the trait so stuff that's going to be on top is actually more relevant than stuff that's on the bottom as at, le at least for myopia that's how i organized it uh for mental health that's obviously not the case this here is organized more so by um more so organized by what the gene is where it's located for example first we have combed then we got maoa then we got all of this panel for drd2 then we got drd1 um, then we got DRD3, then we got DRD4, there's DRD5 here as well, but, uh, and, and then there's other stuff. So in, for mental health results panel, I actually organized it by gene. I didn't organize it by weight or impact, but for stuff like this, I completely organized it by impact for, um, OXTR organized it by impact. For lactose persistence by impact, for hemochromatosis, no. No, for hemochromatosis, not by impact. But for Alzheimer's, it was organized by impact. For MS, it was organized by impact. For this, I don't really remember. I'm not sure. For myopia, it was definitely by impact. So in some of these panels, uh, the results are organized by their respective weight. For miscellaneous section, looks like no micropenis. Definitely doesn't have micropenis. All right, really good to see. No micropenis variants in either of the two variations that code for it looks like she's got mix of muscle types likely more sprinter than rather than endurance athlete one fat gene variant in ftos rs 99 39609 higher odds of obesity and sleep apnea okay she's a little bit predisposed to being overweight it looks like she likely does not have folic knees refle reflex but carries one allele for folic knees reflex all right um it looks like she's got a very european genotype in edzar uh in the edzar gene definitely not in east asian genotype which is um Kind of interesting at what point did the european genotype in edar emerge uh, especially in this variation because if we remember the the videos i've made on chromanions on sungir people they actually had east asian genotype in edar in this in this variation right here but at some point that had to change in europe at some point the european a allele here had to emerge and had to become the overwhelmingly uh predominant allele in europe and I wonder when that happened. Maybe you can write in the comments when you think that happened. For drug response, it looks like she has greater odds of cannabis-induced psychosis, so she probably shouldn't smoke cannabis. 
And I don't think Western hunter gatherers really did that because you know you have to cultivate it at least. So no, I don't think it's relevant to her habitat. But it's just kind of fun to know, interesting to know that she had a greater rose of cannabis induced psychosis. For albinism, it looks like she's not a carrier of any of the albinism mutations, and she's also not a carrier of Melanesian blonde hair variants. Okay, for familiar Mediterranean fever, no risk variants for that. Really good to see for MTHFR panel. It looks like she's got this gene type, which leads to a decreased efficiency in processing folic acid and slightly higher than average odds for a variety of illnesses from autism to coronary heart disease. For cancer panel, we had to watch out for testicular cancer. So let's let's check for testicular cancer. And for testicular cancer, everything's actually looking really good. Look at that. So she's got this gene type, which leads to two times reduced risk of testicular cancer. She's got this gene type, which leads to three times lower odds of testicular cancer. And she's got this gene type, which sort of modestly increases the risk of testicular cancer. So she's actually got uh, really good genotypes in terms of testicular cancer risk. Definitely reduced risk of that. And for leukemia panel, uh, everything looks good. There's this one genotype which sort of raises the odds of leukemia, but everything else looks good. Uh, I really want to see Crohn's though. Let's uh, let's let's uh, wait for that until it comes. For rare diseases, no von Gerg's disease, no variants for Bloom syndrome, um, no GSS. Yeah, it's looking really good. Okay, so for celiac disease, it looks like no risk variants in HLA, no risk variants in this either. Good to see. Uh, for allergies panel, we're gonna skip. For antigen receptor gene panel, it looks like no Reifenstein's, but there was one. There was one allele. There was one risk allele for Reifenstein's that was found. Uh, should I should I really put all of the variations for Reifenstein's here on the screen? I debate it because if I put everything that goes into this really polygenic uh, polygenic uh, page on the screen then the screen is going to be like 20 miles long, long and you won't be able to really, it, it will not be readable. So I don't really know if I want to put that on the screen. I, I don't quite know. Uh, it looks like she's got the gene type, she's to typical or higher odds of boldness though, which is pretty typical for Europeans. So she's a little bit predisposed to um, going bold, male pattern boldness, but she's not a male, so it's good for her. For Crohn's disease, it looks like she does not have any risk variants for that and the important variations really good. So Crohn's, we don't have to worry about that. She's pretty healthy overall. Uh, aside from the Alzheimer's having the risk allele and APOE, aside from that, she's pretty healthy overall. For Canavan syndrome panel, does not have any risk variance for that. Only good to see. For HIV and, and AIDS panel, this is actually really good to see. I mean, this is uh, this is really nice for me to um, examine. She actually has two protective variants in this variation, which leads to 90% reduction in HIV viral load. So she's definitely very protected from HIV. And protection from HIV is a very European it's a very european genetic trait right it's something europeans are known for uh relative protection from hiv and it's something that uh people in the scientific community have been speculated have been speculating for a while why it is the case and one of the speculations is that is that europeans developed these protective variants or at least these protective variants became a lot more common in europeans after the black plague which uh allowed for which, which which sort of sped up the sort of the natural selection you could say towards selecting for these variants that protect from HIV because they also apparently protect from the Black Plague, but I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't really think I agree because I've seen a lot of ancient European samples, uh, hunter gatherers or even the Neolithic farmers from Anatolia, and the protective variants here are really common among these people. I mean, you can see evidence right now. The protective variants in these uh, protect the variants that protect from HIV are really common among these people who lived way before the Black Plague. So I don't. I think it's. Uh, I think they are found at a comparable rate to modern Europeans. So I wouldn't say that the Black Plague really had any impact on this. But once again, I would like to see your uh, opinion in the comments. Write it down. I will read it. We will have a discussion. For muscular dystrophy myopathies, it looks like she does not have any risk variants for that, and zero risk variants for ADL out of fifty. That's pretty good as well. For color blindness panel, it looks like she has zero risk variants in OPN1LW. Nothing was found for OPN1MW, and she has one risk variant in OPN1SW out of eight. So, uh, probably not color blind, but she does have one risk variant for that in OPN1SW. Very interesting. For FTO gene panel, it looks like she has got heterozygous genotype for all of the FTO variations. Very interesting. 
So heterozygous genotype for all of them. Okay. Uh, one fat allele, one skinny allele, you could say. And for bio traits panel, it looks like she's got the genotype which leads to shorter sleep duration, likely European or East Asian. Uh, she's got lower odds of motion sickness, lower predisposition to anger, which I don't really know. This this variation for anger, it's not uh, particularly important. I just kind of added it there because I thought it would be cool to add. Uh, it's not particularly important or decisive. All of the variations that that predict like personality traits and things like that, they're very much uh, thinly. Uh, the, the research is really thin, and uh, there is high p-values, and there is not much conclusive evidence that uh, these genotypes really lead to anything in terms of anger. But you know, I thought it was cool to include here. And she's got shorter telomere length, shorter lifespan. The risk allele for that is G. She's actually heterozygous for that, so she's got one risk allele. That leads to shorter telomere length. And then she's got digit type, which also leads to shorter telomere length and lifespan. And you I, you suppose that the risk allele here is C because she's got genotype CC. Well, that's pretty much all there is to this individual, to this sample. Thanks for watching my video until the end. Uh, leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. And also you can download this file in 23andMe format from link, which is in the description of the video. Thanks for watching. Bye.